Hello and welcome to Welch Lab Chemistry. Today we will be undertaking the final palladium catalyzed reductive homocoupling reaction to make an N annulated perylene diamide dimer, as described in our chemistry materials paper, which can be found in the video description. For this reaction, you will need perylene diamide bromide, which we made in a previous video, palladium DBA as catalyst, and zinc as a reducing agent. You will also need dimethylformamide, dichloromethane, and isopropanol as solvents. To a 20 milliliter microwave vial with a stir bar is added the palladium catalyst, zinc, and PDI bromide. We use microwave vials a lot for our small scale reactions because they are very conveniently sealed, are airtight, and in conjunction with the bead baths, don't need to be clamped. Next, the vial is sealed and purged with nitrogen. After 20 minutes of purging, dry dimethylformamide is added via cannula transfer. Once the solvent has been added, the vial is heated in a bead bath to 100 degrees Celsius. After about two hours, the solution has turned dark blue. This color change is highly indicative of the reaction being nearly or completely finished. To confirm the completion of the reaction, the vial is vented to remove the small overpressure of nitrogen before a small sample is taken from the reaction via syringe to dilute for thin layer chromatography. An interesting aspect of this reaction is that on exposure to air, the blue solution turns to the red more characteristic of PDI derivatives. Since the reaction is being run in a very polar, high boiling solvent, it is important to run a co-spotted TLC. This TLC plate has three spots. On the left is PDI bromide starting material, on the right is the reaction mixture, and in the middle is a mixture of both compounds. From the completed TLC plate, it is clear that the starting material, which is the spot indicated, has been fully consumed and is no longer evident in the reaction mixture, which is the spot on the right. Another way to tell if the reaction is completed is to dilute the TLC sample. When compared to the starting PDI bromide on right, the product on left is a similar color but is much more highly fluorescent. The interesting thing about this reaction is that on injection of air, the reaction mixture immediately turns dark red. We believe this to be a result of excess zinc reducing the product as PDI derivatives are known to be blue when reduced and oxygen in the air reoxidizes the product to the red neutral form. This reaction seems to be reversible, but takes a while. An additional real-time clip for reference is at the end of the video. Having confirmed by multiple methods that the reaction is complete, the vial is uncapped and allowed to cool slightly. The reaction mixture is then passed through a silica plug to remove most of the excess zinc as well as the palladium catalyst. DCM can be used to help the product pass through the plug. After all the PDI has passed through the plug, a gray band is clearly visible at the top of the plug as well as a second band lower down. All this is the excess zinc and the small amount of palladium catalyst. After removing the solvent on a rotovap, the product is then taken up in a minimal amount of dichloromethane and passed through another silica plug. Since the DMF has now been removed, the plug goes much more slowly and the remaining zinc is removed. After a few washings, we can see that the top of the silica is light brown and this is the last of the metal contaminants being removed. The solvent is once again removed on a rotovap. Since this is the final compound in the series, purity is extremely important and to achieve high purity, we will recrystallize the product. The product is taken up in isopropanol and transferred to a large Erlenmeyer flask. More isopropanol is added to total about 250 milliliters. The mixture is then boiled and stirred until crystals form. This is easily monitored by watching for the solution to lighten in color and for a light precipitate to form. In this case, the crystallization took about two hours at a full boil. To prove that these are in fact crystals, we can look at a sample under a polarized microscope. Under normal light, the material looks like small, needle-shaped crystals, and under cross-polarized light, the crystals light up, clearly showing that the needles are in fact very small crystals. Since the material appears to be crystalline, we can proceed to filter and isolate the solid product. In this case, the filtrate is quite dark and will probably be a significant loss of product. 
If a higher yield is desired, it is possible to concentrate the mother liquor and isolate more product. When isolating this material, it is important that it is this bright orange color. If you skip the crystallization, it will be a dark red color and it will retain some impurities. After isolation, we are left with 588 milligrams, which corresponds to a 66% yield. To evaluate the purity, we can once again examine the proton in our spectrum. As usual, we can see peaks at 7.26 ppm, which corresponds to chloroform, and at 1.5 ppm, which corresponds to water. We can also see a broad peak at 4 ppm and a doublet at 1.2 ppm, and these correspond to isopropanol residual from the recrystallization. Otherwise, we see a very characteristic aromatic region with three singlets and two doublets. These correspond to the five inequivalent protons on the PDI core. Since the only impurities we can see are volatile, the material is pure but needs to be stored in a vacuum desiccator before use to remove residual water and isopropanol. In total, for the series of six reactions, we have obtained an overall yield of 45% and very pure product, without the use of column chromatography and using relatively inexpensive starting materials. Due to the facile synthesis of this material, it is a very promising material for use in organic solar cells. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, like, and comment. Please join me next time when I show how this material can be used to make a functional solar cell.